Welcome back everyone to Unique's Digital Experience Artificial Intelligence Week, co-presented by the Goethe Institute. I'm Julian Wadsworth. And I'm Caroline Busta of New Models in Berlin. For anyone not already familiar, the Goethe Institute promotes the study of German language abroad and encourages international cultural exchange around the world. And Unique, the European Union National Institutes for Culture, is a network of EU organizations engaging in cultural relations to strengthen dialogue, cultural cooperation, and diversity worldwide. Earlier today, we spoke with four people thinking intensely about how technological shifts and specifically the notion of artificial intelligence impacts our understanding of the creative act. We heard from Professor Marcus du Sautoy and Octavio Cules, followed by a conversation with curator Marnie Benny and artist Sophia Crespo. For this session, we will give you the opportunity to experience something a bit different. In a few minutes, we'll be joined by two Berlin-based artists, Moises Horta Valenzuela and Yana Sutella, both of whom are working with and speculating upon the possibilities and implications of machine learning and AI. Moises Horta Valenzuela is a Mexican-American sound artist, composer, music technologist, and performer inspired by the sociopolitical and geographical context of his border zone hometown of Tijuana, Mexico. Moises harnesses data, sound, programming, and bio and neural feedback to create multimedia works and performances. And this evening, he will be performing a generative audiovisual piece under the guise of his stage name, Hexorcismos. We hope you are wearing nice headphones or at least are plugged into some good speakers. Your ears will be thankful. Without further ado, please welcome Hexorcismo. Hi, thank you so much for the nice introduction, Julian and Carolyn. And uh, hi to everybody who's watching at home, and thank you so much for the invitation. So uh, I would like to present uh, this piece. It's a perform generative audiovisual performance titled Nel Tocone in Quicatl, which in Nahuatl uh, language means talismans in poetry. Uh, it's a multi-channel audiovisual poetry piece, generative, uh, com comprising of three disembodied artificial intelligence systems, uh, which are uh, trained on pre-Columbian sound forms, poetry, and images. So uh, I will just start with that. Hi, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you can hear us, but we have a uh, issue with no sound coming through on the video. Uh, okay, I can fix that once. Okay, we can start from the beginning. And yeah, if too. you'd like to start from the sure. beginning. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> no problem. Uh, also, we'd like to invite anyone uh, to share questions, uh, comments in the Q using the Q and A button at the bottom of the. Uh, Zoom window because we will be having a uh, uh, some time for questions uh, and sharing your comments with the rest of the audience. Thank you. Yeah, please share links also. And I already see some people in the chat. That's great. Go for it. Okay, so sorry about the technical uh, issues. So here it goes again. Um, and just a few more words about this piece. Um, so uh, Nel Cotoni in Quicatl is an iterative performance uh, present in multi-sensory experience. It's a symbiosis between artificial neural networks 
and ancestral technologies of the mind. It acts as a form of resistance to the colonial practice of language hegemony or erasure of uh, languages. So uh, all this piece is uh, made in either Spanish or Nahuatl, which is the pre-Columbian Mexica language. So uh, without uh, technical issues, enjoy.
Thank you, Exorcismos. Um, thank you, Moises. Um, just to, before we move to Yana, just to clarify, so that was actually a live performance. You were modulating what we were seeing and what we were hearing in real time. Do you want to say just a word about that so it's while well, it's fresh in people's minds? Yeah, sure. So in a way, it's a new kind of performance, not in the traditional way, where each time this is actually built on a on a game engine. So it works in a way that each time I, I perform with the system, it kind of plays different content. So each time I play it, it's, it's slightly different, but the idea is the same. So it's... Um, this piece is uh, it's a way to talk about the colonial process, specifically in Mexico, by taking uh, the images of uh, a lot of these objects in a very kind of metaphorical and abstract way, but also quite direct. It also talks about the representation in current uh, AI art, uh, which is mostly because of the research done, it's mostly uh, developed in the global north. So uh, this is... Um, uh, a way to apply what uh, the philosopher Syed Mustafa Ali talks about when he speaks about decolonial computing and decolonial artificial intelligence, uh, which he describes as a critical project uh, that is about interrogating who is doing computing and what they are doing with it, and uh, both epistemology, uh, the ways of knowing and engaging with these technologies, right? So in a way, it's a, it's a, a way for me to relate in a more ritualistic way uh, with my own culture, uh, engaging with artificial intelligence and deep learning uh, technologies. Super cool. I can't wait to talk with you more about this yeah. um, when when also Yana is also part of the dialogue, as I think there'll be some pretty interesting crossovers, but For sure. it's very, it was very cool. I think the, the compression, how much did you, oh, I wonder if you can even experience it. I wonder what degree the compression actually altered what we finally heard, or if compression is very much part of the texture of the piece. Yeah, I would I would say that I'm not aiming for super high resolution also uh -huh. as a political stance, uh, like cool. citing Tito Stairl's uh, idea of like low, low resolution as a political yeah. act. Uh, so yeah, it's like, um, maybe on my side, it looks a bit better, but the, the, the glitch of the transmission it kind of adds to it as well. Yeah. I think that's a way a lot of us are rolling these days, right? Like that for we sure. just have to accept it and embrace the glitch, so to speak. Definitely. Um, okay, so thank you, Moises. Uh, we will see you in about 15 minutes or so. Um, we are now going to go to Yana Sutella, who's also a Berlin-based artist, a Berlin-based Finnish artist. Um, 
Oh, me. <laughs> okay. A Finnish musician, artist, and writer based in Berlin, who is currently a remote visiting artist at the MIT Center for Art, Science, and Technology, CAST, where she is developing a project on expressing molecular vibrations in audible space. Jenna is hardly a stranger to non-human intelligence. Her work with Fasarium polycephalum, I hope I said that right, um, or many-headed slime mold, for the few of you who may not be aficionados of the Faisaridae family, uh, examines decentralized intelligences through the complex problem-solving ability of this single-celled organism, some call a natural computer. Yena will be streaming an excerpt of her film, uh, Namia Seti, in which machine learning is utilized in an attempt to generate a new written and spoken language based on a su supposed Martian uh, tongue channeled in the late 19th century by medium Helena Smith, uh, as well as the movement of the Bacillus subtilis bacteria, uh, which may be familiar to those of you who might be joining us from Japan, as it's the bacteria used in natto, which is a gooey, stringy, fermented uh, soybean food that uh, smells kind of like sweaty feet and tastes absolutely delicious. I, I take Love pride natto. in my unusual <laughs> enthusiasm for eating natto. I recommend you all to try it. Uh, I just hope my natto does not start uh, talking to me as a result of uh, Yena's project. <laughs> I hope it does start talking to you and tell you to please stop eating it as um, I can smell it for the rest of the day when you do. Anyway, everyone, it is healthy. It actually does. Fills you with power. Once you get into it, it actually does. It's like you just have to, yeah, if I need, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> do try it, but uh, ask your loved ones first. Anyway, without further ado, please welcome Yena Sutella. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, Caroline and Julian. And thank you for the invitation, Pedro and Munich. Uh, and thank you, Exorcismus, for the performance. And I'm so with you, Julian, on the natto eating. <laughs> it's also known to known as this uh, secret to long life in Japan, particularly. So, so it's a healthy eat. <laughs> Vitamin K two, I believe, a, a, a rare source of a, a high high value of vitamin K two. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna screen a video. Um, that's part of my project Nimia Seti. Uh, this, this video documentation is actually from 2018. And as Julian already uh, mentioned it, it's, um, it sort of uh, generates, uh, use, uses machine learning to generate the new written and spoken language. And it's based on, maybe I'm repeating a little bit now, but so that everything gets said. <laughs> it's based on the computer's interpretation of a Martian tongue from the late 1800s um, and originally channeled by this spirit medium, Helen Smith. Um, and now it's voiced by me. And then the movement of this uh, healthy Bacillus subtilis natto bacteria that also exists in our, in our guts. Um, and the machine in the Nimia Seti project is really a medium. Uh, a spirit medium also uh, channeling messages from entities that usually cannot speak. Uh, but the work is also about intelligent machines as uh, aliens of our creation. So there's an interesting link between the project of talking with aliens and the problem uh, of talking with machines. We build at least some of these aliens ourselves and now the challenge is to understand the sort of non-human condition of, of them. Uh, and the machines really work as our interlocutors and, and infrastructures more and more. Um, so for example, the, the so-called black box problem in machine learning means that it's sometimes hard to explain how an AI has come to its conclusions. Um, and the video that I'm gonna screen soon is uh, 12 minutes in, in length. And it documents this experiment in machine learning and interspecies communication. And I worked on it together with the, the ML geniuses, Memo Akten and Damien Andri. Uh, and the breathy sounds uh, are played by my, Miko Klein in contrabass recorder and Shinjo Morgantini in flute. Um, and maybe I should still, to give a little bit of context uh, in terms of what you're gonna see, what the video shows is a computer watching footage of the Bacillus subtilis bacteria under a microscope and generating a script or 
this sort of calligraphy based on an analysis of what it sees. Um, you could imagine a pen suspended from a long piece of string that's sort of resting on paper that's slowly sliding sideways underneath. And raw force from the movements of the bacteria sort of knocks the pen around, leaving marks on the paper. Uh, and the audio interacts with the bacterial movements. And what you will hear is the computer reorganizing or, or mimicking the early Martian language. Um, this network that's trained on my voice looks at each frame of the video and produces a short block of sound that it thinks matches that frame or the configuration of bacteria in, in it. And another layer of sound, the sort of vocals uh, present the more, presents a more typical approach where the network simply generates more of what it has heard before. Uh, anyway, let's watch the video and then we can talk more afterwards. 12 minutes, I believe, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the video is approximately 12 minutes long and then we will uh, have a Q&A. And it you. will not be stored in the stream. So uh, watch it now uh, uh, or yes, uh, hope that you can see it at some point in the future. Okay, Yana, that was so beautiful, I guess, as, from a human perspective anyway, uh, we'll use that term. That was fascinating. Um, let's also bring on exorcismos if we can. Um, I have one technical question for us. I know Julian has a, a bigger macro question. The writing that we were seeing there and the characters that were showing up, is that a consistent transcription? So when the AI brain, when it saw a certain characteristic or it would form a certain character and it would consistently form that character. So was that really like a kind of language or was that a free associative um, modulation of form depending on various factors? In terms of the, the calligraphy, you mean? It, or the, yes. Yeah. And then the characters that maybe were a kind of subtitle underneath, or could you just briefly clarify what the relationship was between uh, yeah, the script and the letters? And the sound. Definitely. Yeah, so so the the kind of the uh, teaching material in the project was um, beyond the bacterial movements was this uh, the Helen Smith's uh, Martian uh, channelings or or so so there was this uh, it's actually really interesting to me because I've been looking into or looking at like Lossolalia or speaking in tongues also and these kinds of unconscious forms of, of language. And it turns out that perhaps the earliest document of Glossolalia is Helen Smith's Martian <laughs> from the late eight, 19th century. Uh, and it was documented, it was written down uh, by Theodor Flournoy, who uh, was a lingu linguist and psychologist and who kind of recorded, not on, on tape, but recorded uh, in writing um, Helen Smith's seances at the time and analyze them but and also because she kind of gave meaning to whatever she channeled from the martians um, because she claimed to be able to communicate with them and and they found that there was this kind of interesting syntax so there's actually this even though Theodore Flournoy like um, uh, thought that it sounded or it had like a lot of characteristics from French which was uh, Helen Smith's uh, uh, native tongue, but but they found that that the, the Martian language also had an interesting syntax of its own. So I basically had uh, I recorded everything that I could find from Helen Smith's Martian on on tape, and and then I also used the the sort of the the, the Latin alphabet uh, descriptions of how they would sound. So so basically, what's happening there is that. My recordings were just um, um, pieced into like tiny clips that then the, the machine kind of combined with uh, certain movements of the bacteria uh, in each frame of the video uh, as it saw best and, and created this kind of system between these two things. Um, and then it also uh, turned into this crazy sort of like chorus almost like this sort of buzzing sound in the background. Um, and um, and then that other approach. So this was basically based. This was an approach based on a program called Grandma that Memoac then uh, created. It's this kind of granular neural music and audio um, 
algorithm. And then there was another um, algorithm, um, sample RNN, which is the more kind of uh, common one to use. That's kind of the vocal track on top. Uh, that's just sort of uh, generating more of what it what it heard or learned from my recordings of Smith's material. Uh, and then there's a slightly slightly separate uh, from that is the the calligraphy that comes from the bacterial movements uh, in the petri dish so it is actually it's kind of the strongest forces from the bacteria sort of determining where the the line goes um, and it's made into this sort of a little bit anthropocentric <laughs> i must say in in like uh in retrospect that it has this kind of writing type of uh also like a western <laughs> direction but uh but still to kind of make it make it seem like some sort of writing um there was this kind of effect of almost like pulling a um, um, paper underneath the the bacterial pen that's more <laughs> more accurately this uh, actually shown um, uh, there's this part of the video where the calligraphy starts to appear but then in the middle of the image there's this sort of uh, central uh, point and that's actually more apt description of the bacterial forces <laughs> so you, you've made it linear in order to better communicate it to a human audience but as the computer would write it it would just be over itself again and again that kind of like infinite um uh, impasto scribble? or something or a scribble yes and there's yeah. also um a question um by lady pelamore in the q a maybe at some point um she uh, this user is interested in the name of the program. And if you could respond with uh, the program that you used, uh, she would be interested to know. Um, I know uh, you have a question. Well, also, uh, uh, Moises, what, did, what was the language you used in, in your work? Yeah, so for my my uh, performance, I used Nahuatl, which is the language spoken still in, in Central Mexico, and before it was Mexico, the Mesoamerica region by <clears throat> Mexica culture. Um, I actually trained a GPT-2 model for uh, on a book called uh, 15 Poets from the Nahuatl World, which is a compilation of, of a poetry by um, by uh, different uh, poets who were like quite well known in, in, in Nahuatl and Aztec culture. Uh, but I had to do, the interesting thing is that I had to do a bunch of data augmentation because just the fact that not a lot of this, um, it was not a culture that was like written language, it was mostly a pictographic culture. Uh, so a lot of these uh, po like poems are actually passed on through uh, oral tradition. And then after the, the colonial process, it was transcribed by some, um, yeah, uh, different uh, fathers, or how you say the, the, yeah, the missionaries, you know, people. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's mostly in Nahuatl. And actually for the sound, uh, the, the actual images are driving the sound. So I do a sort of a visual sound approach to it. So I first translate the GAN. So I'm using a generative adversarial network for the images. And then from these, I tra I'm translating the RGB data of these so as to have these uh, images or these objects talking or singing in themselves. And then I use a st audio style transfer model to transform this um, RGB data into uh, different uh, different styles of music. The first movement is, um, and I trained it on an album by Antonio Cepeda, which is a Mexican percussionist using mostly pre-Hispanic instruments. The second is trained on my own music. And the third is actually trained on um, a generation of jukebox that I, so basically I trained a jukebox model uh, to perform tribal, which is the style of music from a contemporary style of music from Mexico, electronic music. So from these, I'm actually training another AI to try to kind of do a style transfer from the jukebox style into, into sound. That's it. So it becomes very abstract and to get this kind of feedback loop essence of what the AI um, aesthetics are in a way. Right. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. I, uh, so tomorrow, we actually, the, the focus of tomorrow is uh, is language learning and education. So it will be interesting, interesting to think about both of these performances in the context of tomorrow and what happens when you do have uh, a machine learning element that is trying to read human communication and then uh, translate it from, you know, from 
one language set of humans to another language set of humans. Um, but it's interesting, you know, in this week, we've been speaking a lot about how we need to center humans in the AI experience. And, and of course, what's meant there is center humans as opposed to capital. Uh, that I think is the implication when we say that. Center humans, the human experience, human well-being. But what I love about both of your performances uh, or works is that you decenter the human um, within other intelligence networks, or at least the human in 2020, and you uh, you make us remember how arbitrary, in fact, um, our code system is and our language system is. And I know Yana is uh, is the mother of a young child, and I can imagine watching, you know, and listening to your daughter go through language formation must be quite fascinating. And you know, you must already kind of speak her language as much as she speaks yours, and and that kind of going from like primordial brain to like educated brain. Um, there's a, both of your works remind us that, you know, also the, the faces that you're showing um, uh, Moises in, in your work um, and like how they could be Gans, they are Gans faces, but like how arbitrary it is what we settle on uh, like the, the sort of refined signs or the correct signs. Um, and yes, I, I like how you actually decenter the contemporary human in, in both your works. Um, I thought the alien uh, metaphor also of, of uh, building artificial intelligence to the intelligence is that we we are ultimately building uh, aliens that are uh, looking at us and studying yeah. us and trying to uh, figure out how we work. Um, I mean, that the global financialized capitalism in itself could be considered a a sort of alien um, uh, existing in a different sort of complexity and directing us in, in different ways, yeah. I, I think. Um, but thinking a lot about this and especially how much it relies on on pattern recognition within your works and, and it generally on machine learning relies on pattern recognition, I, I kept thinking about apophenia, um, you know, sort of uh, recognizing pattern uh, in in data that actually doesn't have patterns in in sets of random data, right? Which is a, a, a an aspect of, of schizophrenia, uh, and I, I wonder if AI or machine learning actually uh, does it suffer from apophenia? Is it uh, schizophrenic? Is it finding patterns, extracting patterns? Uh, any chance it, it it can even in uh, sets of data that are random yeah, or, or discriminator do not have, have patterns, yeah. How do you, everyone talks about generating images um, using machine learning, but what about keeping the machine from generating images that you don't necessarily like want to see or the restrictive part of that? Right, to make Sanity. it- Sanity, how make do you make it, a sane yeah. machine? To make it simple and provocative, is AI schizophrenic? Yeah, so I think this is a super interesting point because for my performance, I was actually selecting and going to the latent space of this of this trained GANs and not just like inserting noise. So it was like a conscious decision to go into these different latent space walks by selecting the images that were meaningful to myself, right? So the ones that were more evocative to myself. It, so I'm not trying necessarily to decenter the human in this performance. Actually, it's quite the opposite but also to capture more of, of a collectivity, like a human collectivity per se. Of course, it's channeled through my own preferences, but I think what you're saying is super interesting because yeah, if, if you just have a GAN and you obviously have to feed it some noise, then you're gonna have these random images that maybe make sense or you want them to make sense if, yeah, just because of your own motivations. Otherwise, I think the, the interesting way to approach these systems of image synthesis or audio synthesis is when you actually curate them for meanings that you actually want to convey and or maybe meanings that you were not conscious about before and then present them in the future. I don't know for you, Jenna, how, how was your process in this regard? Mm, uh, like your process, I think my process involves a lot of sort of editing and in interpretation while it also um, involves this idea of, of like you were um, describing um, how you're addressing kind of the, the collective of humans maybe. And, and in my case, it's often like the collective of humans and, and machines and bacteria, for example. So I'm, I'm not sure if I forgot to mention the, uh, it in the beginning, but 
beyond being this kind of uh, potent gut bacteria, the, <laughs> according to some recent spaceflight experimentation, the Bacillus subtilis bacteria also seem to survive on, on Mars. So they might be the kind of actual Martians, but, but it is interesting that they're also part of our guts and maybe our kind of uh, thoughts and emotions through that and, and how these sorts of forces are already speaking through us in, in many ways. Um, and, and the same thing that a lot of, there's a lot of machine communication going on, on behalf of us. Um, and I've been also, uh, I've been curious about, well, I've been, I've been dealing with kind of, or, or looking at um, living materials as, living materials as random number generators, but also looking for messages or signs or symbols and, and things in, in something chemical reactions and, and, and uh, bubbling uh, kombucha cultures and things like this. Uh, so there's definitely this uh, <laughs> apophenia or, uh, or I've been often referencing the surrealist paranoia critical method also that, that I think it's, <laughs> it's quite interesting how, how also like, um, like in some way the work is about this kind of getting in touch with this non-human condition of the computers and the, the, the bacteria who also, that also make us who we are. But, but then it's also about the, the computers sort of getting in touch with the more than human world around them. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, Moises, I wanted to ask you uh, about uh, uh, decolonial computing, because uh, I, I, I'm not, I, I'm familiar with uh, computational col colonialism uh, digital colonialism. Yeah, digital. The separate though. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. but yeah, um, uh, Kili Mabembe has uh, talked about it. Uh, but uh, in terms of decolonial computing, I'm interested in in what frameworks uh, would be uh, considered different than the ones we all take for granted now. The sort of deterministic uh, frameworks that that uh, the north, the computing in the north and western hemisphere t tends to. Uh, be built upon? Yeah, so I think uh, like I'm base, basing a lot of my ideas on the, on the work of Syed Mustafa Ali and uh, other thinkers around the issues of decoloniality because decoloniality is a, let's say, multidisciplinary approach, transdisciplinary approach. It doesn't only uh, apply to computing, but it basically, to put it in very clear terms, is to um, center the experience or the objective of, in this case, computing on the real life and on the daily quotidian life, instead of focusing on the institutions of, or as you were saying, this alien, hypercapitalistic, deterministic future that is often portrayed in, in techno, techno utopian and uh, narratives, right? So I think it's a way to kind of, uh, uh, in my work, I see it as a, as a, very small step into okay representing other futures other possible futures that can be included in the narrative of artificial intelligence um personally i don't believe in these narratives of like singularity that we're gonna eventually merge with with ai um because they're they're driven by by some kind of profit and in a very specific idea of what computing can be um so yeah, so basically like this idea of decolonization is uh, applied in the sense of like, okay, I come from a place like Tijuana. I grew up there. Um, what is the, what are the contexts that formed me and kind of question myself when I engage with computing? Of course, like I'm not an engineer or programmer, but I think this, this uh, is also kind of explored in the ideas of uh, Yukua, uh, philosopher, where he is talking about techno diversity and actually building from the ground up technologies informed by different cosmotechnics on culture. So cosmotechnics meaning how do you relate like technology as a cultural phenomenon or technology as a cultural manifestation? Like we are living in the in the age of like that we are forcing or not forcing, but we are kind of engaging with uh, uh, with computation from a very specific set of cultures. So how do we, can we even uh, go beyond that? So it's it's kind of like this idea of decolonization in computing too. How do we go beyond um, determinist narratives or how do you bring your own culture or your own experience into these uh, technologies? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, do we? Do you have another question, or do we have enough time for it? I have another question if we have enough time for it. But uh, 
maybe we ask as a speed round or uh, you know, oh, it's a perfect speed round <laughs> question um are there religious implications of ai <laughs> i mean I, i'm just thinking about uh, sort of um the hallucinogenic uh world scale pattern uh recognition enhancement of uh certain shamanic practices uh for instance some from central uh, america uh and uh i i wonder you know if ai similarly could could grow or be developed to play this religious role as a sort of oracle or pattern recognition enhancer uh or teacher on on the scale of everything which is a scale uh, it could conceivably understand but we could not I mean, that, that, that's a that's an interesting question because, I mean, in, in the work you see uh, behind me, this this is actually a, a two neural networks tripping on themselves, so having some kind of like feedback experiment, and you and you have these very interesting patterns emerge when. So it's not a GAN actually; it's a neural style transfer model, two neural style transfer models feedback on each other. Um, I think it's an interesting question because I'm not sure about like what is reality in itself, like reality as large or, or, or the psychedelic experience, but um, I wouldn't put my trust in any technology as something that can define everything, right? Like I, I would never put my trust because that in itself is a bit totalizing. But I, as being, having had uh, psychedelic experiences myself before, I do see some, some kind of uh, parallels between computing and, and, and a psychedelic experience where you kind of get unfiltered from the, from the meanings of daily life. And then you just experience reality as it is or- Sure. You know, and Yana, I wonder, especially like in sense of an oracle of some sort, how, how it might work, especially with your work as a lens. Yeah, I've, I've definitely explored this kind of oracle um, channeling aspect um, of it, like like in this in these types of ways that that we talked about before, like like sort of finding meaning or or patterns in in randomness. Uh, but I guess it always comes down to in terms of these uh, the the religious thinking, for example, like who's Who's technology and and how can we? What kind of technology could you go get behind <laughs> in in those those ways? Um, because that's uh, I, I I guess the 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 question of also as an artist kind of working in this technological context that you're often there's very little this sort of uh, non instrumentalized space in that field and. Uh, and 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 how could you actually focus on on things in themselves when all the things are so costly and lead, need a lot of lot of computing muscle and, and so on? Like how can you approach them beyond their use value in order to kind of create something, uh, some sort of space beyond that? Um, I think is like a big question when yeah. it comes to that future. <laughs> The massive, massive uh, carbon footprints of the new gods. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, maybe Yana and, and Moises, before we go, you could put your um, a link to more information about like your work, or maybe it's a reference that you can um, in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, but we will, um, uh, as we sign off, but we will thank you very much for sharing your work with us tonight, Yana Sutella and uh, Exorcismos or Moises Orta Valenzuela. Um, and they're both based in Berlin. A look out for them. I'm sure they will be uh, performing and presenting their work in other contexts, perhaps worldwide if Zoom is the, is the new normal for, for the foreseeable future. Um, but thank you. And uh, we hope you have a good rest of your night. Yes, and see you uh, tomorrow for... Uh... Yes, and so for everybody else, um, uh, we will be back uh, at noon tomorrow for the fourth and final day of, of the UNIC Goethe Institute's Digital Experience Artificial Intelligence Week. Um, so 12 noon CET time, uh, where we'll be exploring developments, how developments in uh, the field of machine learning are directly impacting the future of learning and what new skills both teachers and students may need to best prepare for a future where AI plays an active part.
to be a particular focus as well on uh, language learning. So yeah, this will be great to take very with us relevant there. for the performances uh, this evening. Um, a, a few, uh, just a moment to say the credits. Uh, we want to thank the Goethe Institute and UNIC uh, for putting together this conference. The concept is by Gita Chalk of UNIC. Uh, the curation and production is Jeanette Neustadt of the Goethe Institute. Technical production is Pedro Yardim of New Kin Co. Animations and technical support by Tim Novikov. Graphic design by Amelie Bakker and Atelier Brenda. The coordination is Lina Kirya. So Viate and Giacomo Corongio and Robert Keith and I'm Caroline Busta. I'm Julian Wadsworth of New Models and we wish you a good evening in Berlin and a day in California and we hope to see you tomorrow at 12 noon CET for the final day of this conference. Eat more natto. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks everybody. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you.